Picture this. You wake up in a foreign place with a sense of dread. Cloaked in darkness, you tiptoe about the cold, damp floor, barefoot, with nothing to protect you against the elements but your favorite yellow raincoat. You look around in bewilderment. No weapons, no sense of where to go, and nothing but a lighter to illuminate your way. The real kicker, you're just a small child. And what you fear the most, or maybe what you haven't quite let yourself accept yet, is that this place, this empty vessel, is not empty at all. It has creatures lurking in every corner. Creatures so unimaginable, so frightening. They are but the things of your little nightmares. In this puzzle platformer adventure game, the emphasis on nightmares in Little Nightmares is highlighted more and more as the story progresses. Let me proceed this review by saying, I can only speak to the base game and not the three downloadable chapters. And that, for sake of having the best experience playing this game, I chose to not watch any walkthroughs. So if you find yourself questioning some of my choices, which we will get into, pretend I'm building IKEA furniture and throw out the directions. In chapter one, The Prison, which is shorter than the other chapters and serves as a tutorial for the game, we learn how to navigate the Maw, playing as six, whom I've read as nine, a tad confusing, but hey, if it works for 11 in Stranger Things and she's 12 in season one, then well, we'll let it slide here too. So here we begin waking up in a suitcase fitted with a mattress clad in yellow, of course, you'll blend right in, if you're an 80s horror fan like me, then your first thought might be, well now I know where Pennywise took Georgie. Quick to realize that you have no provisions but a lighter, you'll notice that in the entirety of the first chapter, I am constantly turning it off. I was worried I would run out of fluid, or worse, alert an enemy to my whereabouts. The game is not that multifaceted, which is not to say it's lacking. It's just not part of the objective the objective to elude, survive, and escape. I did luckily light the lantern in this first room. These denote save points. Forget about hugging gnomes or breaking statues, which are part of the achievements. If it moved or looked ominous, I considered it a threat. Unlike the first actual enemy, leeches, they will absolutely strangle and suck the life out of you. Crawling through vents, the games will guide you in the first chapter on how to duck into these small spaces, as well as how to light lanterns, pick up, grab, push, throw objects, jump, sprint, and well, that's it. These are all the things you do. Don't expect to fight. You're nine after all. Once past the vents, the game only goes up from here. Literally. A wide expanse of area opens as you pan out to a staircase and six begins to climb. A ship's hull in the background, the game never disappointing with graphics and capturing an overall feeling of sinister things to come. And speaking of, my first eye-opening wow moment as a pair of legs simply dangle from the ceiling. You don't need to pan up to know why they are there. Nor can you, which in my opinion was something better left to the imagination. It added more by not adding that which was not needed. For a small chapter, it set the mood in terms of creep factor. The enchanted eye, the Ma's security, always watching, if caught in its lit path, you will turn to stone. Measures to keep the orphans in and deter the rest from trying to escape. If that's not terrifying, the monster watching over the sleeping children will give you chills. Don't move, don't breathe, but hide when this large hulking creature comes to check on its captors. You won't like the results if you meet. Hunger also plagues six as you begin to double over in pain and feel woozy. As you stumble along, barely able to put one foot in front of the other, a shadowy face beyond the prison bars notices you, stands and tosses you a chunk of food, which Six devours in a feral manner. Insert goosebumps here. If you're lucky enough to make it past all these things, don't count your chickens just yet. There's always your own misjudgment in calculating a jump, or not moving fast enough that can kill you. The prison is just a brief introduction of what is to come, and so, so much more. In the next four chapters, the difficulty only intensifies. 
Chapter 2 finds us in the lair. We continue to work our way through this puzzler. The first major plot twist in this chapter is when hunger strikes six once again and you find another chunk of raw meat being chewed on by two large rats in an open cage. Trap, yes, obviously, but what are the options here? I approach the cage, the rats scatter and scurry away, and of course, as six enters the cage with ravenous oblivion, the ground begins to shake and the lights flicker. This is a cutscene. You are too consumed with consuming when a large hand enters stage right, shuts the cage, and snatches you up. Is this the end for six? Maybe. Or maybe you'll get away because there's still three more chapters. In the next cutscene, six wakes in a cage stacked atop another. As I nudge my cage towards the edge, dropping it, it breaks open the door. As you look around, you realize the room is filled with cages, and these cages are filled with children. You are not able to free your fellow prisoners, but you can use one trapped soul to boost you into reaching a lever that opens the next room. Finding your way out of the room will not lighten the mood of this dark, twisted game. The fate of the children is revealed, and so is the monster, a blind creature with a heightened sense of smell, better known as the janitor. He is busily working away, wrapping tiny bodies for transport to somewhere else. The only way to overcome the janitor, evade, hide, he can smell you. And if you are not clever, he will find you. The entire chapter, this blind creature is always in the background, always working and searching for the one that got away. And if that wasn't enough, there is a vast room filled with shoes that seems eerie on its own. But as you wade through the pile, a monster lurking beneath the surface chases you, but with one goal in mind. The end game for this chapter is running away from the janitor, following a set of tracks that leads to a closing door, being wedged open by a wayward cage. Thank goodness for irony. The thing that once contained you will now help set you free. You must keep a safe distance from the hot pursuit of the janitor's eager hands, while also trying to pry apart the cage to sever the long, gangly creature's arms. As the arms go limp and the cries of the creature subside, you can now jump up to the open vent door, climb through, and make your way to chapter three. The kitchen. It sounds delightful, since Six has been starving and feasting on scraps. Some of my best memories involve the kitchen. Sitting around the table, playing board games with my family, the smell of my grandmother's homemade bread baking. Cowering in fear while leather-faced chefs presumably cut up children while wafting in the aroma of fish heads and the dead and decay that is all about. Like I said, delightful. That last one might just be for six. If you thought getting to the hump of the game would mean things would only look up from here like a Wednesday, well, this game is a perpetual worsening Monday. The puzzles are harder, the chefs are faster and more vigilant, and save for the smell of fish heads throwing off your scent, your quick maneuvering and hiding in small spaces is key to survival. If you swoon at disgusting creatures lifting the flesh off their faces to scratch the itchy spots, if you enjoy grinding mystery meat to swing along sausage lengths to escape, and if you find visual stimulation in swathed bodies hanging like macabre chandeliers, you're gonna love this one. You're especially going to enjoy the potential for dying and respawning over and over and over again. And if you're as skilled as me, you're gonna like it bunches and bunches. Run, jump, die, repeat. Run, jump, die, repeat. And if you haven't guessed, run, jump, die, repeat. The chefs move fast. You must move faster. No missteps, no hesitation, only linear point A to point B movements. Get to the conveyor, latch onto a hook, don't let go, and worry about where it is taking you later. Chapter four, finally free, because outside equals freedom. Nope, it's chapter four, not chapter five. As you reluctantly climb back into the ship, trust me, I consider jumping in the ocean, but I don't think Six can swim. And in this chapter, the guest area, we get an insider's first person view of what gluttony is really like. It's here that I started to piece together some seven deadly sin references, and I'm not alone. After I finished the game and did a bit of research, a lot of other gamers and reviewers supported this same theory, but we will discuss that in a bit. 
The guest area can be summed up neatly in two simple words, gluttony and evade. I didn't realize how truly frustrating this chapter would be. Don't get me wrong, it was equally as well thought out and visually terrifying as the previous chapters, but if I died a lot in the last chapter, it was nothing compared to the groundhog repetitiveness of this one, in two separate areas. For the most part, you just need to sneak around the guests and find your way out of the room. They are too busy chowing down to notice something so minuscule out of reach. If you get within reach though, most definitely they will eat you. Fresh Child is a caviar comparable delicacy that no glutton would pass up, but just take my advice and keep a safe distance. Okay, so here comes the rage. When you finally figure out what you're supposed to do, because apparently not all similarly height chairs or stools will allow you to reach and pull yourself up to the bar, but once you do, oh boy, it's going to get so much better-ish. While running across the bar top, please take caution in avoiding many menacing, hungry creatures. Make a long jump, forgetting not to latch, or you will fall and start again. If you are successful climbing their correct path up the latticework to an opening, jump across to a swinging tray of food high above the bottom of the and then jump from the tray to the next floor where you guessed it, more lovely creatures are shoveling food into their pleasant plump mouths. Now do this 786 times. Not really, but you get what I'm saying. Things have gotten a bit quiet now because after a big meal comes the big sleep. However, these people have noses like bloodhounds and it's not long before they all start crawling on all fours, scratching their way along quicker now, numbers growing, to be the one to win you as their midnight snack. You must run constantly, jumping up a small elevation in the floor, continue running, they are hot on your tail. Run downstairs, avoid the first dresser tumbling, the sheer weight of the horde following you causing the floor to quake. The next dresser narrowly missing you, you must jump but you are getting tired. Now jump up on the next few obstacles across the table, avoiding some of the mob that haven't quite finished their bottomless buffet. Jump across to a hanging lantern and wait but a millisecond for the winner to hit the lamppost, falling to her death, but helping propel you forward out of harm's reach. Simple enough? Insert laughter here because the thumb wounds are still too fresh for actual laughter. Hunger returns, but lucky for six, because luck has always been on her side, there is a sausage link that has somehow gone uneaten. And you also get to see the friendly face of your only true friends, the gnomes. That's when Six reaches for nourishment and rips apart the gnome, killing it as she bears down into its body, without regret and no other thought or desire but to feed. We are losing this little girl and yet I keep waiting and wanting for more. The last and final chapter ties it all together. The flashes of the geisha in the opening scene start to make some sense, but at the same time are not completely cohesive with the story. Unless, like most people, you believe this lady and her quarters to be none other than Six's mother. A quick chapter, but just as terrifying. Mannequins everywhere. I just know at any moment they're gonna move. They don't, thankfully, but that's part of the game's charm. Preying on those fears, making you think something will happen and waiting in fearful anticipation. Then again, this happened. So really, you just have to fear the geisha in this chapter and fear her you will. She doesn't have to chase you, she just has to sense you. Creep along the shadows while she grooms and stands mesmerized in her mirror humming a spine chilling tune. She's gonna be pissed when you go into her bedroom and break her vase, but she'll have vanished. Chasing you here and there until you reach the mannequin dead zone, the room past this will be your salvation in the form of a single special mirror. I assume it allows the lady to see her true form. Stay in the light and point the mirror in her direction to reign victorious. It only takes the four or five tries, but this is the end. Well, kind of. The last blast sends you both tumbling to the ground. Lights flicker and die, and then they come back on. One small spotlight on six, one on the lady, and the hunger is back with a vengeance. There is only one path, and it is towards her, towards the huntress towards the thing that preys upon small children. The thing so self-absorbed, it is littered through the entire game in the shape of small ornamental figures that six breaks as an achievement. The final achievement, satisfying the ultimate hunger by taking the life and the soul of the final villain and breaking her by becoming the biggest bad of six's nightmares.
The final scene speaks so well for itself. Here's a few short clips. So here's my final thoughts. Sometimes a developer gets it so right, you'd have to feign shock if you heard they had a real life Monsters Inc. nestled away in their basement, in their sweet little suburban home. In this case, Tarzer Studios grabbed my attention with strength and precision in chapter one and kept a stranglehold on it right through to chapter five. I have but one con, and that is sometimes the game had glitches that could only be overcome by shutting down and restarting from the last available safe spot in that chapter. In one particular spot, one of the chefs come down an elevator shaft after I pulled down a lever. I wasn't fast enough the first time around and he caught me. Lights out for six. But as I respawn and attempt to get the chef to come back, knowing now that the elevator is my only way out, the lever is already down. That's it, one con and more of an inconvenience than a con. The pros are many, and that's assuming you like puzzle platformers with an edge. And I do. The graphics were top-notch, and all the imagery preyed upon your fears perfectly. The seven deadly sins were apparent throughout the entire game, and instead of giving specific details, the Inhuman One, a fellow YouTuber, did a great job of explaining it, and I will provide that link in the description. The music was ominous and dark, setting and matching the tone for the entire game. The controls were actually quite easy. No complaints whatsoever. The storyline was my favorite pro of all. The evolution of Six's character was unexpected and fascinating. And if you enjoyed this game, you're in luck. There are three DLCs available now and A Little Nightmares 2 in the works to be released in 2020. Hey guys, thanks so much for watching. And as always, please don't forget to like, subscribe, comment, ring the notification bell. I'm having so much fun doing these reviews. Um, it's something new for us. Uh, I have to thank Denver Gamer as this was his uh, pick for March. He had three picks. I typically pick one, but all three games were so good. I had to play them all. Um, you can check out my other review of Detroit Become Human and that's already out. And then I will also have a review out for what remains of Edith Finch later this month. So until then, game on.